Hello, I am Fantastic and Fantastic, and today I want to talk about the Heroin Rag Machine, which has just returned once again to North America. So, the Heroin Rag Machine is one of the oldest special events out there, and because it is a gung ho owned IP, it should be returning on a regular basis. So, the concept of like FOMO or fear of missing out should be a little bit lower. And then, with that being said, usually when there are reruns, there tends to be buffs and upgrades new cards added etc etc but unfortunately for us north american players this is purely a filler event and a pretty big slap in the face when i think about it there are zero buffs whatsoever if you cleared the dungeons in the past you don't get any extra free rolls this is just simply a machine stuck in here to try and tie us over until the next event it feels underwhelming it feels sad basically every single card is the exact same as it was X number of months ago when it first came out. And there is definitely some cards that gained a bit more value simply because the meta has shifted and or changed, especially when it comes to C Tona and Naughty Oak. But that being said, the rolling rates look reasonably healthy, but for 10 magic stones, this feels pretty overpriced. Like I have virtually no interest in the bottom rarity cards. The vast majority of six star cards, I don't have much interest in. And the seven star rarity, well, some are obviously quite nice, but again, for 10 magic stones, a pretty low chance to get something good, I wouldn't even bother rolling. Even if you're a newer player who hasn't rolled this event before, I would still just save until the next rerun because like I said, this is a gun ho owned IP. It can come back in theory anytime they want and hopefully there will be buffs and or new zest the next time it does. So for myself, I just did my free rolls and dipped out. There is a story mode and if you haven't cleared the story mode in the past, it's still available. And there are some magic stones to collect from there. But other than that, this is a pretty underwhelming event. But with that being said, I want to talk about what I feel like are a bit more of the noteworthy cards, so to speak. So one of the cards that made a big splash quite a while ago is Kuraha. Because for Elfride teams, she is a pretty magical sub. Because triple 10 combo obviously does meaningful amounts of damage. And then the active skill after they've transformed becomes a three turn cooldown that gives you one turn of damage and attribute absorption cancellation unlocks the board and creates six fire and six light orbs over non hard orbs. So you don't erase hard orbs. Elfride wants exactly six light and exactly six fire matches repeatedly. So this technically gives you guaranteed two of those, but the problem is you're not certain if it's gonna be like, you know, you need usually three sets of these sixes in order to kill stuff in super gravity. Probably two is enough in regular dungeons though. But because it's a three turn cooldown, you can chain her active skill alongside Elfride's Many teams initially utilize two of these, and you could monster exchange for them. So, like, in theory, you could potentially populate your Elfride team with, you know, a stellar sub. But the drawback is, well, Elfride is just as good as she was before, but C. Tona and Naughty Oak, who the vast majority of players have acquired at least one of these cards, tends to be a bit su superior choice for these UN-based dungeons. Now, obviously, like, maybe you don't have a good team for those stuff, maybe you feel like Elfride is the way to go for yourself, but again, you can utilize them on other teams, because when you think about it, triple 10 combo with a VDP is never going to necessarily be too out of style necessarily, and the active skill is still helpful, especially if you're a mono light or a mono fire team. The main drawback is you only get two skill boosts in their base form, and it does give you 100% shield, so it's kind of like really three effective skill boosts, but I think it is a strong card, but because of like Royal, like Naughty Oak and C Tona, just not as magical as Elfride used to be, just because there were better options. If they didn't exist, I would be much more inclined to trade for this card. The next notable card is Aura, and Aura is a background music card. So if you have the funds to do so and you feel like this card will bring you joy, it can be purchased. And when they are utilized as a card, they have a two skill boost with three turns of delay, so essentially five effective skill boosts, and then once they transform, they will have four 10 combo awakenings, a cross and an L, so immense amounts of personal damage will be effective in super gravity style dungeons. On a four turn cooldown, they give you a full cleric style active skill of clearing bind, awoken bind, and unmatchable, along with creating a single spinner that changes every turn for one second, well, every second for one turn. So you could overwrite nasty spinners that like there's too many populated on your screen, and it also just gets rid of like, you know, bind, awoken bind, unmatchable. So as a card, it can work quite well. And then as a leader, they're actually respectably strong as well. They give you bonus combos and auto follow-up attack for each match of exactly five connected fire, dark, or heal orbs. So 
This is kind of similar to, you know, the other scaling leaders we have out there, like, like Kaishu and Prim, who want to utilize, like, specific colors and hearts. Well, Aura does that sort of idea as well. And the multipliers are great. Like, a huge... It's more than four, 16 times effective health, because I feel like there was a point in time where, like, four times effective health per leader was kind of like the big thing, so to speak. If you hit that threshold, you were very durable. You had the ability to tank and basically just grind through things. And now we're seeing cards with more and more and more numbers. So Aura definitely falls into that category. And with a scaling leader skill, in theory, your damage output is amazingly high. Now, be mindful of the fact that Aura themselves can't double damage cap because they are transforming. And you do need to make sure you have, you know, Orb generators who make fire, dark, and or heart orbs to, you know, ensure you proc this on a regular basis. She doesn't actually have 7x6 built in because she's transforming. You can't do, like, the swapping such as, like, New Year's Fair rule. So it does have some potential for sure. And then as weapon assists, she can have three fingers. Like, it's a lot of movement time when you think about it, along with a full cleric-style active skill, a spinner, and a movement time buff. And then the other weapon assist gives you a skill boost and three team RCVs. Now... It is going to have an active skill that's quite similar to any other, like, looping shield active skill. A good example is Crusader, who has a wonderful active skill through their weapon assist, a, basically a looping style shield. So you inherit this onto a low, low cooldown card. You're going to have nearly 100% uptime potentially, or 100% uptime is a one cooldown card on this shield active skill. Now, it does give you team RCV instead of HP, and to a certain extent, I feel like HP tends to be superior unless you've already hit whatever HP threshold is necessary for the dungeon, then more healing actually helps out but point of the matter is it's a strong looping shield style active skill and you can directly purchase them and they may end up being a strong leader as well the next card i want to draw attention to is dorna and dorna is actually monster exchangeable like kuraha so yay if you have trade fodder available she may be a good choice to pick up and the reason why she's so strong is that in this form in particular she is amazing for Tona teams and in theory probably royal oak and nautilus because you know you don't even need to be on color when you think about it because you know all that really matters is the leader is doing all the damage so dorna in this form can have up to six skill boosts they have super poison resist they have a five turn cooldown active skill which is easy enough to inherit over top of eight latent slots and then for this active skill it's 0.25 times rcv which will overwrite any other rcv debuff one turn of three times attack buff and then for two turns you get bonus combo count of three and then finally you get two turns of void damage void so this is a seven star rarity card which means it does compete with like things like jean pierre or hands or wang yi so if you don't have these cards or other good void damage void options for your c-tone and naughty oak teams Dorna can be a phenomenal choice to fit in because she's going to overcome multiple different problems. Like bonus combos helps you overcome problems in UN3 such as the negative combos on floors 2 and 3 that will persist there. It does help you against Sima Yi in the end. The void damage void is obviously beautiful and with two turns you can actually smash your way through things much quicker than you normally could. So it's a pretty strong card. Even though I do have the options I listed beforehand, I am tempted to pick up Dorna simply because it gives me alternative flexibility. It opens up different team building options because like I said, bonus combos can be good when you're trying to play through content faster because who wants to like wait, grind through stuff when you have to wait? Let's go faster. So Dorna definitely can be a stellar pickup for that reason alone. So a good candidate for monster exchanging for. And then the next card I want to draw attention to is Patty. And Patty is an orb skin card. And Patty has kind of gone from somewhat zero to absolute hero with the introduction of Seatona and Naughty Oak. Because in these super gravity dungeons, many cards just don't do enough damage. Even triple 10 combo doesn't really hit that hard nowadays. And in all honesty, your leaders for like Seatone and Naughty Oak are doing all the damage on the team. No one else even has to deal damage and you're going to be perfectly fine, which is a really strange design. So Patty in this base form gives you two skill boosts and then gives you two turns of haste when transforming. So that's quite pleasant. And then when she's transformed, she has five team HP awakenings. Two seconds or movement time, a single L, and bind immunity. So much utility brought into a single card. And this is kind of where the meta is shifting now. No longer do we need to have every single card dealing large amounts of damage when one card can deal like 
potentially 18 or 24 billion damage from a single card. The entire team's output can be done in one card, so you don't necessarily need to have all the cards dealing damage. Instead, you need utility. And Patty through Awakenings gives you a gargantuan amount of HP. Five Team HP Awakenings along with over 10,000 HP. So pretty outrageous overall when you truly think about it. And the extra L utility can take the assist restoring ability now they are an eight star rarity for your naughty oak sea tona team so like just be mindful of which slot they are taking up and then this active skill is also beautiful you get two turns of damage and attribute absorption cancellation you unlock the board and create wood light and heart orbs so the unlocking of the board is valuable because there will be instances where the board is locked and you won't be able to you know orb change accordingly patty solves that two turns of absorption cancellation for damage and attribute absolutely amazing card in this day and age and if you do have disposable income it can be a great choice to pick up because assuming this meta of like maybe two cards do all the damage on a given team and everyone else's utility patty's going to fulfill that role for a prolonged period of time gung-ho loves to throw in absorption spawns because there's no way to overcome damage absorption except with an active skill so it's just going to be a thing for i think forever in all honesty so patty may potentially be a great long-term investment if you have the disposable income to pick her up Another card that I found interesting that I don't actually own is Tierra for rainbow based teams. It is a transforming card, so it doesn't hit as hard unless you use their active skill because it has three turn cooldown, gives one turn of four billion damage caps, so then they'll be doing meaningful amounts of damage, and then one turn of damage and attribute absorption cancellation on a three turn cooldown. So this is actually pretty spectacular for your rainbow based teams. Now, the biggest drawback is, well, are we playing in super gravity dungeons? Because rainbow based teams tend to be less great in super gravity dungeons simply because the damage is not as concentrated overall. But for non super gravity related content, it can be a great option for your rainbow based teams. Drawback is you cannot monster exchange for Tierra. You have to actually roll them because they are a six star rarity as their base form. So mm, don't want to roll in this event. If you got her from last time, cool. She's just as good as she was before because no actual buffs. And then finally, I feel like Chirun and her weapon assists are always cool. Maybe it's because I have a little bias because water or blue is my favorite color. And her fist is pretty magical. Double team HP, cloud resist, and three water rows. Pretty great for those mono water teams, which are not really that prevalent at the moment, but maybe they will be some point. Again, weapon assists tend to last for a prolonged period of time of being useful. And then this active skill is actually pretty amazing too. You get three turns of void damage void, three turns of attribute and damage, uh, blah, blah, sorry, three turns of attribute absorption cancellation, and then three turns of bonus combos, and then unlock all orbs and change the board to water and hard orbs. It's doing quite a few different useful mechanics. And again, assuming you inherited on a card who could utilize it early on in the dungeon, you can overcome significant number of problems. But then her other weapon assist gives you four rows, bind immunity, uh, Combo Warp, Team HP, and then four turns of damage and attribute absorption cancellation, and then that unlock with Heart and Water Orb. So again, like Mono Water teams are not that great, but I always like, like playing them, and I always feel like, hmm, if I had this weapon assist, I could do some things with it. I don't think it's worth trading for. I see it every time it comes around. I just pray I roll her. I obviously don't, but hey, maybe what next time around I'll roll them. So like these are kind of the more notable cards I feel like. Navi's weapon assist might be useful as well because it's a looping shield. I probably should have pulled up Navi as well because when I think about it, Navi is actually much better than she used to be because she has a seven turn cooldown that gives you six turns of damage reduction and a single turn of haste. And then in her weapon assist forms she has this it's a skill boost co-op boost three attribute awakening and then it gives you that same essentially looping shield style active skill or at least it's a long lasting shield so it's never going to be a bad thing in that case and then the other weapon assist it's two attack while above 50 percent mm, okay it could be hard to pull off but like Navi is interesting of a card. Again, you have to roll them, can't monster exchange. It's nice if you get them, but like I wouldn't go out of my way to roll in this event. So with that being said, those I feel like are the more notable cards in the Heroin Rarig Machine. I don't think it's worth rolling in because again, no buffs. They should have given us some buffs. I don't see why they shouldn't have. Like we have no event happening for at least a period of time. So it just feels a little underwhelming and they could have, you know, 
throwing us a bone, so to speak. But regardless of all that, let me know what you, ladies and gentlemen, think about this event in the comment section down below. Do you think it's actually worth rolling it? I don't think it is. But if you did roll in this event, did you get actually something of meaningful value? Regardless of all that, hopefully all you lovely ladies and gentlemen out there have a truly fantastic day. I wish you the best luck in your own pad adventures, and happy puzzling.